Hello everyone, welcome back to Just My Stupid Opinion. I'm Adrian Lloyd. And today I wanted to talk about the current banking situation that we have here in Canada and all across the world. Um, it's been about a year or so since the last time, well, since the first time I should say, that I really looked into our current banking system. And I noticed the first time that I looked into it, some very startling things into how it operates. And the more research that I ended up doing, the more and more I realized how the banking system is a con. It's built from the top down, very much like a pyramid scheme. And to me, as I look at it, it I can only see it as it's only a matter of time until the whole thing comes crumbling down. Um, I'm sure that most people are familiar with the term debt slavery. Now, debt slavery is a process in which you keep people in a perpetual state of debt so that way they can't really get out of it it's a form of control the more that somebody is underneath the boot of debt slavery they're not really going to rock the boat they become more docile at just because they're trying to make ends meet they can't take time off work they are forced to work longer hours harder for less pay and less benefits this is something that we've been seeing for some time as the generations have gone by, it, we're starting to reach a point where, for the first time in a long time, the, the current generation of millennials, and possibly even for Gen Z as well, for the first time, they're going to be worse off than their parents were. And this is the result of high debt, high inflation, the devaluing of the dollar, which are all tactics that are used in the current banking climate these days. So this is the reason that debt slavery is the most effective form of control. You're being controlled and you don't even know about it. See, if it's something more along the lines of they're trying to silence you, which is a form of control even in and of itself, you know that this is happening to you and you're you're going to find other ways to speak out. You're going to find other ways to fight back. But with debt slavery, it seems like it's one of those things that's just part of life when in fact you're being, it's being manipulated right from the top of the of the central banks and the international banks it really is the best form of control see money in and of itself doesn't necessarily equal power there's plenty of wealthy people out there that just don't have any control over people don't have any control over politics or the society but if you control the money supply itself not just have money but you control that money well, then you have all the power in the world. You have the power not just in your nation, but in other nations as well. And this can be seen through the banking dynasties that are out there. These banking dynasties, which include people such as the Rothschild, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, these sort of people who have for a long time had such astronomical wealth that people can't even imagine it. These people... They do everything that they can in order to make sure that that wealth stays within the family if, to the point where they'll even go as far as inbreeding with each other. And this is something that has happened with the Rothschilds. I know that for a fact. I believe it's also happened with the Rockefellers as well. And the reason is, is they don't want to share that wealth with other people. The more that they, the Rothschilds would marry outside of the family, the more that that wealth gets spread around amongst the uh, the common people, the plebs, if you will, the peasants. So, and they, and they don't want that. Because you can even see what ends up happening to a Rothschild when they do marry outside the family. When a Rothschild marries outside of the family, they tend to get cut off from that family fortune. Now, if this was just, if they if they were having a fight with the parents, then that's one thing. But the point is, is the fact that they don't want that money to be shared with everybody else. And these are the main people that control the money supply all over the world. Now, the current banking system itself is set up that it is meant to fail. Now, when we even look at a bank, and why is it called a bank? It, it's pretty interesting. I've heard a couple of reasons why. Um, the first one that I've heard has to do with going back to the old banks in uh, the Renaissance period, the medieval time in Italy. The term was known as banco, and banco was actually Italian for bench, which is a reference to the merchants who would borrow money from the rich families that were there, such as the Medici, in order to, and they would in order to uh, 
to uh, conduct their own business. Now, they would take these loans from a bench. This is where they operated from, the first banks kind of thing, before they actually established themselves in an, in a building. They would kind of just bring the money that was agreed upon, and they would hand it over to the merchant, who then would be forced to return that money later on with interest. So this was one, one that I heard as the reason why it's called a bank. But there was another one which I feel is at the very least, more realistic into how a bank operates. I'm sure most people are familiar with the term a river bank. Now, the river bank directs and controls the flow of the water in the river, just like the banks do in real life with our money supply. It it seems to me that this is the most likely likely reason that it's called a bank because this is exactly how they operate and this is how they control us. When you put people into debt, they're less likely to speak out. They're less likely to go against the current banking system. They're less likely to go against the government. They're less likely to speak out about this big government because the big government tends to also give back money to the citizens. Ironically, it's money they've taken from the citizens, and then they're going to return it. Um, we kind of see this right now with the child pen uh, child benefit plan that we have here in Canada, where they take taxpayer money that you paid into, you and I paid into this. They take it and they return it to you and say that they are helping you out. Well, personally, I think that if you had kept that money in your pocket, you probably would be better off to begin with. And they do this sort of thing, but it also puts, when you have so many social programs it starts beginning to put your nation into a state of debt and they need to borrow more money. And the process just continues and continues. So when I kind of look into our monetary system, I began sort of thinking about how it's kind of built like a pyramid scheme, like a Ponzi scheme. It really is just a con. So when we kind of look at how it operates, you've got at the very bottom of the totem pole are, is the population. We're the ones that we work for our money, we spend our money, we put the money back into the bank. Now, the next tier up are the banks themselves, and there's a number of different banks that we have available to us. Um, this includes some banks that only loan out to businesses. This includes some um, some debt consolidation, these sort of things. But what we're going to be focusing on are commercial banks because commercial banks are the ones that we're most familiar with. It's the one that you and I deal with. A commercial bank can be just your small local bank. Probably people in small towns are more familiar with those. Or it can be one of the big five banks. And one of the big five bank, uh, the big five are... TD, CIBC, RBC, Scotiabank, and the Bank of Montreal. So these are, are the five big ones that we everyone knows about, everyone is aware of, and they control most of the money supply that we have here in Canada. So these type of banks is where you put your money into, they issue out your checks, your credit cards, they'll give loans to you on a personal level, le on a personal level, they'll give loans to businesses, they'll give you a mortgage for your house, all this sort of thing. So these, this is the next tier up. So we've got the population, then we've got the commercial banks, and a, a step up from there is the central banks. Now in Canada, that is the Bank of Canada, and in the US, that's the Federal Reserve. Now there are some differences between both, the, both these banks, even though they are centralized banks. The Bank of Canada is a public uh, is a public bank, while the Federal Reserve is a private bank. So there are differences in how it operates, but the process is more or less the same. That these are the people that print the money and they give out that money to these commercial banks and to the government. They give out these loans. Now, even higher. Even higher than the centralized banks are the international banks and the international um, uh, the international banking organizations. So the international banks, we're talking about the, uh, the World Bank, the Bank of International Settlements. And when we're talking about international uh, banking organizations, this is like the International Monetary Fund. So if you kind of look at it, Whenever money is loaned out, it's always given back with interest. 
So it always has got to work its way up. The population owes money plus interest to the commercial banks. The commercial banks owe money plus interest to the centralized banks. And the centralized banks, or the nation more in particular, they owe money and interest to these international banks when they take their loans. So when you kind of look at it this perspective, it begins to look like a pyramid scheme. Because when you kind of take the interest into, into consideration, there's almost no way that you can ever really pay off your debts that you know to the these international banks. So you're constantly in a state of, the nation is constantly in a state of debt, and they can never really get out of it. And we can see well, this happen in the U.S. The U.S. as it stands owes something like $33 trillion in debt. That is their national debt right now. So they owe this money, but they'll never be able to fully pay it back. So what ends up happening? They raise the debt ceiling, and that means that the U.S. can borrow more money. So the they process just keeps continuing, and this process keeps continuing, not just in the U.S., but all over the world, which means sooner or later, it's all got to come crashing down because you're going to keep putting on more debt and more debt that you can't pay off. You, you're more, more often than not, you're just paying the interest payments on that debt. But when the interest payments become too high and you can't afford it anymore, you go bankrupt. That's exactly what's happened in the past in many different nations, and that's what's going to happen to our country, to the U.S., and many other countries around the world. Now, just like in any pyramid scheme, the people at the bottom are the one who suffers. Now, if we're looking, uh, we look at other pyramid schemes, it is people at the top who could suffer. Like Bernie Madoff, when he did, he did the biggest Ponzi scheme, the biggest pyramid scheme in history. He made out with billions of dollars, and he ended up getting charged for it and going to jail but we're not really dealing with an individual just stealing money from businesses or people right now we're talking this on a global scale and we already know how the banks can get away with just about anything this was seen in the 2008 financial crash i remember that pretty vividly because i was um about 15 at the time about 15, 16, when, uh, the two, when the 2008 financial crash ended up going down. So I remember how hard it was in order to make ends meet. But when you look at what ended up happening was the banks gave out all these predatory loans to individuals for their mortgages. Things that people had no business buying into. And when they couldn't, uh, when they couldn't pay it off... These homes were foreclosed, and many people's lives were completely destroyed. Now, the banks knew what they were doing, and they went, uh, they themselves nearly closed because of this. They themselves nearly completely crashed. But instead, the governments ended up giving them bailout money. The biggest example is in the U.S., but people don't seem to realize that even here in Canada, we ended up giving out bail money to the banks because they too were in danger of becoming insolvent so they we end up giving these monies out to the banks we gave them out to these people on wall street and what did they end up doing they ended up giving bonuses out to their top executives i know this for a fact that aig which was one of the uh one of the companies one of the uh, the financial companies one of the banks that was really involved with everything that ended up going down they gave their top 70 to top 75 executives about six to seven figure bonuses so not even including their salary so when things were at their worst when it was the first the worst financial crash since the great depression the banks got bailed out and the people who were responsible for it truly responsible for it got off scot-free in fact they made money out of this while people the average person lost their home so this is why the people at the bottom when this whole system comes crashing down it's going to be the population who suffers they're the ones who are going to suffer from the extreme hyperinflation and devaluation of the dollar they're the ones who are going to lose their homes lose their jobs find it nearly impossible to feed their starving family while these rich bankers, the people like the Rothschilds, people like the Morgans, people like the Rockefellers, they're going to be the ones that still get off scot-free. They're going to be the ones 
that have all the money that it's not going to affect them whatsoever. And they're not going to, they're, they're so rich that this is not something that's going to affect them. Their lifestyle will not change. By the end of it all, when everything crashes and burns, they're going to be sitting there on top of the ashes. In a lot of ways, what we're dealing with reminds me of that saying, when usually you're speaking about an individual, a type of individual and the attitude that they hold, where they say they would burn down the kingdom to be king of the ashes. This is exactly how these bankers operate. So, if you look at it from this perspective, then it really is a pyramid scheme, plain and simple. The, the money just keeps working its way up the pyramid to the top, and every single dollar has interest on it. It means that this is an unsustainable method, and sooner or later, it will fail. There's no doubt about it. You can also look at it from this way. I'm, right now, just for the sake of what we're doing here, I'm going to create a new currency. We're going to call it Jimso dollars. So I've just created Jimso dollars. And I'm going, I created the very first Jimso dollar, and I'm going to lend it out to you at 10% interest. So I've just given you that $1 of Jimso dollars, and I'm expecting back from you one Jimso dollar plus 10 cents. Where are you going to get that 10 cents from? It's not in circulation. It hasn't been created yet. So how are you going to pay me that extra 10 cents that you owe me in interest payments? Every single dollar, every single one is debt. And there's no way out of it. Now, this is what the problem is with fiat currency, which is what we have right now. Fiat currency is not tied to anything. See, back in the day, the currency of a nation used to be tied to something. A lot of times this was gold, but it can also be other precious metals such as silver. Silver was another one that was used. In fact, if we go back far enough, then your currency was literally made out of this. You would have a gold coin or a silver coin or type of precious metal that would signify how much currency you had in circulation. So if you if we look back to the gold standard, which is what many nations were on for a long time, the gold standard was that every dollar, every paper dollar that was in circulation represented how much gold reserves that you had. So you could not print more money than you had in gold reserves. If you wanted to print more money, you had to find some way in order to get more gold. And that would mean either mining it, purchasing it from another country, but this is the only way that could be done. So you would have some inflation, you would have maybe a little bit of fluctuation in the value of your daughter, your daughter, the value of your daughter, the value of your dollar, but not much. And it's because it's tied to this precious metal. The fiat currency doesn't have anything that it's tied to. It, it is kind of, we compare our currencies to other currencies, essentially. So a lot of times, especially here in the West, we are tying it to what the US dollar's value is. And this we can be seen with how we look at our loonie. The loonie right now is whatever, about 75 cents or so to the one American dollar or 77 cents, something like that. So that is how we do it. We do it. We compare it to the U.S. dollar, although some still all compare it to the petro dollar, but the U.S. dollar over here is really what we tie it to. But there's nothing that really gives our current, there's nothing that really gives our current money, our fiat currency, any value. Now, if you look back at an old American dollar bill, it actually used to say on it that you could redeem that bill for its value in gold. So if you were walking around with a $100 bill, you could then redeem that $100 bill for however much ounces of gold it was worth. Or grams of gold, I suppose, or whatever, uh, whatever it was worth in gold, you could redeem it for an actual piece of gold. And it was like this for a very long time. 
Now, the British, along with her allies, so this included Canada, ended up abandoning the gold standard at the outbreak of World War I, and it was almost necessary at the time. The reason they had to abandon it was because they were facing a global war on a scale that they had never seen before, and they had to put a lot of money and a lot of resources into it. This would be for paying for the soldiers, paying for the equipment, paying for the the bullets to be made and the shells to be created so it was just not feasible for them to stay on the gold standard at that time they needed to print more money to pay for it so they abandoned the gold standard and printed more money both our countries did this now after world war ii ended there was a time where it was uh where it stayed as a fiat currency but they did eventually return to the gold standard they did this in about the mid-1920s. I think Canada was 1925, if I'm remembering correctly. So they returned to the gold standard, but then they abandoned it again after the Great Depression hit. So the uh, it was abandoned by about 1931 or something like that. And now the U.S. abandoned it a couple of years later. It was in 1933, and it was actually spurred on because the Bank of England ended up abandoning the, coal, the um, gold standard, and they too were feeling the effects of the Great Depression. So all these nations ended up abandoning the gold standard, and this and in the U.S. it ended up happening under the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, a year later, in 1934, the U.S. actually made it illegal for people to own gold unless you had a license. So this became known as the um, the Gold Reserve Act, which was telling people they had to turn in all their gold to the federal government. This could be any bars or gold coins that they had, all the way down to gold necklaces and bracelets. And so this ended up happening in 1934. The abandonment of the gold standard allowed for the massive inflation that we've seen over the last century with nothing that uh, to tie your money to it allows the banks to print as much money as they wish this is what the danger is whenever a politician comes out and says well in order to pay for this social program we'll just print more money that is the fastest way to devalue your currency and we've seen politicians in our countries and other countries have said that over and over and over now if you want to see what a, devalue, a devaluation of a currency looks like, all you need to do is look to Venezuela. Because right now, the currency in Venezuela has been so devalued by hyperinflation that people are literally just throwing their money into the streets. You can go out there and you can find pictures and videos of people who of um sorry of streets and gutters that are just lined with money because it has no value to people anymore they can throw away a couple thousand dollars and they're not losing much money you hear stories about how people walk into the grocery store in venezuela and pay for their groceries with wheelbarrows full of uh of money because that's how devalued their current um this is how devalued their current um uh currency is um now, the thing is about this is that I actually believe that there's more going on in Venezuela than just what meets the eye. Socialism has led them down this path without a doubt. But I believe that there is also some manipulation that is going on behind the scenes by these international banks in order to try and sort of be a payback for Venezuela. See, when Hugo Chavez took over control of the country, he ended up, the country owed debts to the International Monetary Fund, which is pretty much a front for the Rothschilds, which we'll get into in a little bit. But they owed money to the IMF, and Hugo Chavez ended up managing to pay off all their debts to the IMF. He ended up doing this because he um, he nationalized the, uh, the oil in Venezuela. So... In doing so, he man and managing to sell it all over the world. Venezuela is like the richest oil country in the world or something like that. He paid off all the debts that they owed to the IMF. But the IMF was, was expecting Chavez to take out more in debt. He didn't end up doing this. He wanted nothing to do with the IMF. So years go by. 
Hugo Chavez dies, Maduro ends up taking over. And then we start seeing this narrative coming from the U.S. where they're talking about putting sanctions against Venezuela, where we're seeing, we're seeing what is an attempted coup by uh, Juan Guaido, who is rec recognizing himself as the official president of Venezuela. And they're even talking about possibility of military action against Venezuela. Now, we know for a fact that in Donald Trump's office, in his administration, there is a big Rothschild asset, and this is Wilbert Ross. See, Wilbert Ross' relationship with Trump goes all the way back to about the mid to late 80s or so. Because at that time, Trump was in financial trouble. His casinos were on the verge of failing, and he needed to be bailed out. In comes Wilbert Ross, who gave him money in order to bail him out. And in, But in doing so, again, Wilbert Ross is a well-known agent for the Rothschilds. So he became under the control of the Rothschilds. They gave him a lot of money to keep his casinos propped up, and it's one of the reasons that he that Donald Trump is still as rich as he is today. Years later, Donald Trump becomes the president of the United States. And who does he name to be his Secretary of Treasury? Wilbur Ross. So literally, he put a Rothschild agent in control of the, monet of the money in the United States. And this is why I believe that this is, like, there's more there than just simply that. We can also look at how Russia is backing Maduro government, and there's that constant battle between Russia, the pretty much the three-way battle between uh, the first world, the second world, and the third world, which is, which is America, Russia, Iran, which is going on all, right now. We also see escalating tensions close to Iran, and people are wondering if that's going to lead to war. But this is all this has led to the devaluation of the currency in Venezuela. And because of it, it's no good. To the point where Maduro is trying trying to issue a cryptocurrency. Um, but I think that's more or less failed. Because he was trying to do that in the beginning of 2018. But I've really not heard much about it. So I don't think that ended up going through. Or it failed before anything could really come of this. Now another country where you can see the how devaluation can kill a currency is Zimbabwe. You can go on online and find yourself a picture of a one hundred trillion dollar bill from Zimbabwe. But I do know for a fact that going back to about twenty fifteen, a hundred trillion dollars in Zimbabwe currency was about forty cents US. So it was worth nothing. It was the same sort of thing. You just print out a crap ton of money. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean diddly squat. Now, I think, I'm not 100% on this part, but I believe that Zimbabwe has since moved on to a different currency. They abandoned their national currency and they picked something up, I believe. But this is exactly what ends up happening with fiat currencies. At least when it was tied to the gold standard, how much gold you had in your country meant how much money you had in circulation. Now, the problem is, is that Canada can never go back to the gold standard. Some countries may be able to, but there's no way that that could ever happen in Canada. And I'll tell you why. Because previous governments, going starting with Brian Mulroney, and, but it may even be earlier than that. It may have been Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Who did this? But anyway, previous governments from at least Brian Mulroney all the way up to our current prime minister of Justin Trudeau has been selling off our gold reserves. When Justin Trudeau ended up coming into office, he ended up escalating the sales of our gold reserves. When he came into office on November 4th, 2015, there was about $110 million in US, uh, US dollars. Of worth of gold in our reserves. About a month later, roughly a month, that had dropped to 102 million. By the end of January of 2016, it was 58 million dollars in gold that we had in our reserves, and by the end of February, 24 million. Now, today, we have virtually no gold reserves left here in Canada which is kind of shocking considering that Canada is the fifth larger producer, fifth larger largest world producer of gold.
but we have next to nothing. Even the Bank of Canada has nothing. The Bank of Canada has about 3.4 tons of gold, and that's it, which is nothing. If we want to return to the gold standard, we would either have to find a shit ton more gold, or we would have to purchase some gold from another nation. But as it stands, it looks like going back to the gold standard for our country is just not going to happen. Now, with everything that I've already talked about, there's another practice that the banks use to quite literally create money out of thin air. This is called fractional reserve banking. I've also heard it been called fractional reserve loans. So, but I'm pretty sure the official term is fractional reserve banking. This is where a bank holds a certain amount of money. Like they have, they're supposed to have a certain amount of money in their vaults, but they only have to hold a percentage of that money on hand for people who want to take out withdrawals and things like that. Which is also probably why that if you want to make a very large withdraw, withdrawal of cash from the bank, you actually can't just go in and do it. If you have, let's just say, for example, you have $100,000 sitting in your checkings account, you can't just walk in and say to the bank, I want to withdraw $100,000. Usually you have to go through a process. It takes a few days, and then they will get you your money to do that. Well, this is also has to do with fractional reserve banking. So let's use an example. Let's say a bank has $100 million in their vaults, and they're only required to carry to hold 50% of it on hand at all times. So that means they have $50 million that they can keep in their vaults, and the other $50 million they can give out to other bank customers as loans. So they lend out this money with interest on it, as always, whenever you have to pay it back. So for this example, they've lent out $50 million worth with 10% interest on, uh, on the entire money supply. So when that money is returned to them, they will get have $50 million that is staying in their vault, the $50 million they receive back, plus the interest on that $50 million, which is $5 million. So the bank really has, if there's returned all of it, $105 million sitting in their bank, an extra $5 million that was created out of thin air. It was not printed, it's not in circulation, but the bank suddenly has $105 million. It's just a number in a computer. That's all it is. Now, a bank can pretty much have a fractional reserve lending rate of just about any percentage. So that can be 90%, which means that they can only loan out 10% of what they have, which, is, which uh, some banks do. I would say that probably the most popular one that is used by the banks is 10%, which means they only have to hold 10% on hand, and then they can give out the other 90% in loans. Um, but in Canada, that rate can be as low as 0%, which means that they have $100 million, they can give out the entire $100 million to in loans to the public. Now, I don't think this is used very often by many banks, simply because that if you give out the whole 100%, somebody wants to take out just even 100 bucks, well, then you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I think it's most likely that they use something around 10% fractional reserve loaning rate. So this is what we use right now. The If we use the same numbers as we used before, this means that out of the $100 million that they, they have in their vaults, they only have to hold $10 million back while they can give out $90 million to the customers. So if we use the, the same interest rate as we did for the first example, that means that when the, all the money is returned to them, they have now just created $9 million out of thin air, just like that. So... I'm sure by now you can probably see why this might be a problem. We're talking with what is generally small amounts of money to a bank and to a nation. You take this and you put it on a grand scale. We're talking now billions, 
tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, and you're doing this, you can see where the problem is, because if you have a hundred billion dollars and you, you've you loaned out, then you've just created nine billion dollars in new money, and on and on and on. But the other thing about that, that you got to remember, is that the whole process compounds itself. Now, what I mean by that is when I say the process compounds itself, is that you can do this over and over and over again with the same bank, with different banks, but you can just keep doing this over and over. So you take customer one who spends his money, he's taken out money from the bank, the, they started out with $100, they gave him the $9 million, uh, they gave him the $90. He spends his money at a shop, let's say. The owner of that shop takes that money and then deposits into the bank, which means that from the original money that's created, that, that bank can then loan that out with maybe only 10% that's held back, and they can do this over and over and over again. So for an example that we have... The bank starts out with $100 and loans out 90 to customer one. Customer one goes and spends that money and that money ends up in someone else's account. So he goes and puts and so that person goes and deposits $90 back into the bank. Well, we'll just say it's a different bank for the sake of argument to try and keep things clean. So customer one spends the $90 at customer two's place. And customer two deposits into bank number two. Bank number two, out of the $90 that was deposited, only has to keep $9. And then lends out $81 to customer number three. And this just keeps going on and on and on for as long as you can. So by the end of it, when we're looking about down the line, you, this has been deposited five or six different times. Of the initial $100 that the first bank had, They've just created $468.50 out of it. That $100 has just become $468.50. And the bank has just created $368.50 out of thin air. That money does not exist. So of the original $100 that the bank had, almost $1,000 in new money was created but the money has not been printed the money is not in circulation the money is just a number in the computer so sooner or later this whole process has to fall because these numbers are not going to match up to the amount of printed money that is in circulation which means that the bank will never hold a zero. It will never, when they, you do the math, everything is supposed to come up to zero, right? It will never actually happen, which means that more money has to be printed in order to make up for this new money that was just created out of thin air. And it's a devaluation of our dollar. So this is how they more or less just create money out of thin air You've got to print the money and make up for it. And then the process just repeats itself over and over and over again, creating new money out of nothing. So the Bank of Canada was created in 1934 through the Bank of Canada Act underneath the government of R.B. Bennett. Originally, the Bank of Canada was a private bank, but it, in 1938, it ended up becoming a publicly owned bank. So one of the functions, actually the primary function of the Bank of Canada was to lend money to the government at pretty much zero interest rate. This is why we created the centralized bank to print our own money rather than having the money be created and printed through a um, through a through the private banks for reasons that are probably seem pretty obvious with the interest rates. If these private banks are the ones that are going to be lending money to the government, then then they were going to do so at interest rates. But if we have a, a centralized bank that can loan this money out to the government, and not just the federal government, but also provincial and municipal governments, with no interest rates, then you don't have to worry about going into an extreme amount of debt or having to pay off the interest payments. The thing is, is this ended up changing over the years.
the Bank of Canada is no longer an independent bank, first and foremost. It came under the control of the Bank of International Settlements, which holds the deposit of about 120 different centralized banks across the world. And it's been this way since 1974, underneath the government of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He was the one who allowed this to happen. He sold this out to the international banks. <clears throat> What ended up happening was that the Basel Committee was established in 1974 by the Group of Ten. Now, the Group of Ten was Canada, France, Germany, Belgium, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, the US. So, it's called the Bank of Ten. There's really 11 of them involved. And considering this, considering they call themselves the Bank of Ten and there are 11 nations involved, we can probably see that this is where the problem comes from. Maybe they're not so great in math to begin with. But anyway, the Basel Committee was made up of the governors of the centralized banks from all these countries. And what they ended up doing was coming together and they agreed to the general agreement to borrow. And what this does is it provides International Monetary Fund with additional funds to increase the ability for them to lend out money to different nations around the world. This committee discouraged nations from borrowing from their own centralized banks and to borrow from private creditors. And they were saying that by borrowing from your centralized banks, you actually could see that hyperinflation end up coming out of this when really it's borrowing from these private creditors that leads to the situation that we're in right now. So it was a con right from the get-go. They screwed over their own nations in order to allow, allow a nation to, be borrow, to borrow from their own private banks, but also these international banks, which are predators. They are more like loan sharks than anything else. So this is what ends up happening. Now, why would they do this? Why is because many, at least when we're looking from the Bank of Canada's perspective, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is one of these fronts for the Rothschild banking dynasty and several other world wealthiest people. And this is sort of what I was talking about when I was bringing up Venezuela, is how it could be connected back to the Rothschilds. Many of these governors are connected back to the Rothschilds and many of these other banking families. So if we just look over the governors who have been in charge of the Bank of Canada since the turn of the century, <clears throat> we have David Dodge. He was the governor from 2001 to 2008. He sits as a chairman of the board of the C.D. Howe Institute, where both J.P. Morgan and N.M. Rothschilds and Sons are members. So you can see it there right off the start. Mark Carney was governor from 2008 to 2013, and he has had a 13-year career at Goldman Sachs, another huge banking dynasty and one of the biggest bank uh, banking dynasties on Wall Street. <clears throat> and then from there, we have Stephen Polos, who is the current governor, and he sits as a board member for the Bank of International Settlements, so literally involved with one of these international banks. Now, yes, because this is the Bank of Canada, some people may think that it's, well, it makes sense that they would deal with all of these big banking dynasties and sit on the C.D. Howe Institute or the Bank of International Settlements. But really, all they are is their puppets that have been put in place to control the Bank of Canada to make sure that we're still constantly borrowing from these private debt collectors, these private banks, and from the international banks. I think in some ways it's to avoid any sort of situation that they ended up having with Venezuela, with everything that I've already told you about the history of Venezuela. Now, the Bank of International Settlement, where our current governor, Stephen Polos, sits on, was founded by four people. That's Hajmar Schacht, which is the head of the Reichsbank, Charles G. Dawes, who is the chairman of City National Bank, Owen D. Young, who is the founder of RCA and chairman for General Electric, and Montague Norman, the governor for the Bank of England and partner in J.P. Morgan. We can even look at the last governor right before the Basel Committee in 1974. That was Louis Rominsky, who served from 1961 to 1973. Now, before he was the Bank of Canada's governor, he, in the 1950s, 
was appointed as executive director of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So he too can be linked back to these international banks, to these international bankers, right before all of the governors from these central banks came together to convince the nation to stop borrowing from them. The thing is, too, especially when you look at the perspective of the Bank of Canada, borrowing from zero interest rate or next to very little interest rate doesn't really make them very much money. But if you... But instead, if you end up having them borrow from these private investments, these international banks, which you are probably involved with, or at least getting a cut of, you're going to make a lot more money because of it. So it was Pierre Elliott Trudeau who sold us out these private and international banks to lend money to the Canadian government at all three levels. So the international banks are predators because they come in at a country's lowest point and they will give them money in order uh, they'll give them money saying they're trying to bail them out but in fact what they're doing is they're just like a loan shark they're coming in saying they're going to help you out but then they got you then you are given predatory interest rates that you can never really completely pay back this ended up happening in well venezuela was one of them um this ended up happening to greece when greece was on the verge of collapse this is where the international bankers ended up coming in, <clears throat> and because of it, they're actually keeping Greece in a state where they'll never be able to get out of their debts. And this also happened in Ukraine at the outbreak of the Ukrainian Civil War. I believe in this case it was the International Monetary Fund who gave loans to Ukraine and the Ukrainian government, and because of it, they'll never actually be able to get out of their debt. And by the time that they actually solve their problems over there and they manage to rebuild their country, they're going to be so far in debt that they will never be able to get out of it. At least if you manage to pay it off early enough, you have a chance of being able to get out of this before interest rates become too large. But after a certain amount of time, you, you, the payments that you make on your interest rates are too large and that is what ends up keeping you in trouble and we can even look at it right here in canada to see how this uh what how this works because the interest rate in every nation compounds itself on top of what you already owe so increasingly you owe more money just in interest rates which means the more money you owe in interest rates is less money going in to pay off your actual debt years itself which means as i stated earlier when we're talking about when we're talking about this sort of inter uh, interest rates is that sooner or later you will not have the funds to pay off your minimum payments on your interest rates so when we look at it we had the 1993 auditor general's report which summed up the problem that we face in section 5.41 it's called the cost of borrowing and it states right here the cost of borrowing is the third area that affects the annual deficit. In 1991 to 92, the interest debt, uh, the interest on the debt was 41 billion dollars. This cost of borrowing and its compounding effect have a significant impact on Canada's annual deficits. From Confederation up to 1991-92, the federal government accumulated a net debt of 423 billion dollars. Of this, 37 billion represents the accumulated shortfall in meeting the government's the cost of government programs since since confederation the remainder 386 billion represents the amount the government has borrowed to service the debt cre created by previous annual shortfalls so that last part right there where they're talking about the 423 billion dollars in net debt they break it down between 37 billion and 386 billion so let me summarize for you the $37 billion is simply for goods and services when we couldn't make it work, so we borrowed some money for it. The rest of that money, the $386 billion that we owe, is really all it is, is just the accumulation of interest on top of our debt that we borrowed in order that, we, that some of it has been built up by the interest. Some of that we've had to borrow money just to pay off our interest rates. And it's gotten worse because this is from 1993. If you look at the modern day, the Canadian government pays 
about $60 billion a year just in interest payments on our current debt, which is about something around a trillion dollars. That's every single year. Now, when I heard that, I went looking into how much we money we fund into different programs. And when I looked into it, we spend each year on our military $18.9 billion. Since 2017, public transit receives $25.3 billion, but that's going on over a decade. So that's from 2017 to 2027, public transit will receive $25.3 billion. And the CBC receives $1 billion every year. So if we look at it, if we look at uh, the all of these put together, the military, public transit, and the CBC, we're paying more every year just on interest payments on our debt than we are for all these three institutions put together. That should show you the state that we're in right now. And the thing is, is just between 1974-75 to 2010, Canadian tax taxpayers have paid one trillion one hundred billion dollars in interest payments on the federal debt to these private lenders and the international bankers. It doesn't really get much worse than that. The thing is, is if you uh, you look at, um, I believe it's the Fraser Institute. But other places as well, they've they've looked at the debt, uh, that our federal debt that we've had over the course of um, ever since Confederation, all the way up to 20, uh, I think the report was done up just till about 2015 or 2016 at the time. But you can see how this ended up happening. You, uh, you can look at how in 1974, the debt just, it's on a graph, it just goes, takes a sharp turn upwards. Now, this is, means that within a few years, by 1980, we, uh, we had accumulated more federal debt than we did in either World War I or World War II. Because when we got sold out and started borrowing, the debt just skyrocketed. Now, for those who have been... For those who haven't really paid much attention to what was going on here in Canada, and I don't blame you because this could be very easily missed... But in 2011, there was a group known as COMER, which is an acronym for Committee on Monetary and Economic Reform, and they ended up taking the, the government to court. And the reason they were taking the government to court, the lawsuit that they were filing, was because they were trying to get the Bank of Canada to return to its pre-1974 mandate, which means that they would have to loan money to the government for zero interest payment, uh, for zero interest the lawsuit ended up took years. It went from um, from 2011 to 2017, and it, during that time, they ended up working their way through three separate federal courts and two additional federal court of appeals. But they ended up getting contradictory uh, decisions, so they ended up appealing it to the Supreme Court of Canada. Unfortunately. On May 4th of 2017, the Supreme Court of Canada ended up dismissing their application, which essentially ended their fight against the Bank of Canada. Now, to me, I think this is one of the biggest travesties to happen to Canada. This would have been one of the biggest court cases in all of Canada, especially if it had made its way before the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court rejected them. Now, think about some of the cases that the Supreme Court takes. They do have a say... Uh, complete control, I should say, over who gets to come before them, which ones are the most important. Now, the Supreme Court dismissed a lawsuit that could affect every single Canadian, affect our federal our federal debt, and make it that we're not borrowing money from international banks or private banks, which would change the quality of life, change the way that the government would operate when it comes to its debt, but the fucking Supreme Court of Canada rejected it. I think that's something that they have to answer for. Now, the other thing is, too, is that mo most people probably were unaware that this court case ended up happening. They're unaware because it it didn't get much media attention. You might find the average, uh, sorry, the 
one or two articles that got released somewhere, maybe in the CBC, maybe in CTV or Global. But this should be something that was got a lot of media attention, but it almost never did. I've heard about this because uh, when I was looking through the um, when I was first looking through this uh, whole banking system about a year ago, I found it on some alternative sites where people were talking about the Comer lawsuit. But I maybe you can find one or two articles in all of the mainstream media. They didn't report on this, but they'll report on any little thing that does no real significance here in Canada. I mean, if you go over to Global News, the second that Donald Trump touches his Twitter account, they're all over and they'll have three, four, five fucking articles that come out about it. But they can't spare the time to write one single article about a lawsuit that would change the way that our country is go going, change the financial direction that Canada was in. But they couldn't be bothered to do that. Now, before I leave off, the last bank that we have, that is like the newest bank here in Canada, is the Canada is Canada's Infrastructure Bank. Now, this was created on June 22nd, uh, 2017, because uh, this is when the uh, Infrastructure Bank uh, Act ended up receiving royal assent. Now, the whole point of the Infrastructure Bank is that it's supposed to free up money for the federal government because projects and some of the big projects out there, they could borrow from the Infrastructure Bank of Canada rather than borrow from the federal government. And that way, the federal government could spend some of their own money and on things that aren't important as important to people. So things such as shelters. Things such as this. This is sort of the logic that was put behind the creation of the infrastructure bank. Now, as it's it's a little hard to know yet as to what's going to end up happening with the infrastructure bank or like what their interest rates are, whether those are standardized. Um, but th there we do know a few things. See, the Bank of Canada, uh, the infrastructure bank. Sorry. As of now, has one project that it is that it is uh, financing, and that is a six billion dollar electric rail system in Montreal called the Réseau Express Metropolitain, or the REM. So, as it stands, again, this is the only only project that they've bankrolled so far. But as it stands, the total loan that they've given for the REM project is $1.28 billion over 15 years. And the interest rates on that is 1%, but will then rise to 3% after the 15 year threshold. So 3% on $1.28 billion is a pr fairly high interest rate. So already we can see the problems that are going to come out of this. But the other problem is, is that the infrastructure bank is supposed to be what's known as a crown corporation, which is a publicly owned corporation that's supposed to, uh, to work at least minimum semi-autonomously. The CBC is like this too, where they don't have, supposedly, the government that's telling them what to do. The government will finance them because they see it as a public utility or a public service. But they're not supposed to actually have a say into what's going on. Now, that is already being questioned. See, the Minister for Infrastructure and Communities, François-Philippe Champagne, has stated publicly on more than one occasion that the infrastructure bank works at arm's length from the government, which means that the government does not have control over the type of projects that they have, sets the mandate for interest rates, any of that sort of thing. But as it turns out... <laughs> somewhat unsurprisingly is that this could be not quite farther than, from the truth because a CBC article and uh, ended up stating that it was a quote from uh, from Philippe Champagne but they ended up saying quote the transit project best known by its French acronym REM uh, sorry this is not a quote by uh, Francois uh, Philippe Champagne that was my mistake. But the CBC article says the transit project, best known by its French acronym REM, has been singled out by the Trudeau Liberals as a potential early win for the financial agency. 
which was created last year to hand out $35 billion in federal financing in the hopes of prying, uh, prying much more than that from the private backers to fund construction work. About $15 billion may not be recovered, while the remaining $20 billion in, is in loans to the, uh, the governments expect to recoup. The federal finance minister has to sign off on any financing requests. So if Bill Morneau and the future finance ministers get to sign off on this, then this is showing that the government is not operating at arm's length like they claim. That is doing quite the opposite, and they have a say over which projects get confirmed or denied. So that's not operating at arm's length. But on top of that, some critics of this new bank believe that political pressure was used in order to have the bank select REM as its first project because the Trudeau government have been championing, uh, championing, championing this exact project, the REM uh, rail project, before the before the bank was even created. So, and then the bank just happens to pick up that one as its first project. So we have the finance minister who's got to sign off on any financing that happens with the bank. And then we have them who encouraged their first project to be the REM project in Montreal. Of course it would be in Montreal. Of course it's going to be in Quebec. That really comes as no surprise to me. But when you kind of look at our current financial system, at our current banking system like this, then it's quite clear that we're being manipulated from the top down, that everything that has happened recently has been to make sure that our country gets as far into debt as possible. Because, again, when this whole system comes crashing down, the politician's job will be still be there, even though they have led us very far astray. They will still be there. The big wealthy bankers and banks are still going to be there, but it is the population who is going to suffer. And there is not a politician that is out there that is talking about this situation these days. Now, you got to give credit where credit is due, because at one point, going back about 10 years, Maxime Bernier did use his talk about the Bank of Canada problem. You can find YouTube videos of him out there where he's talking about this situation. Um, and even when the bank of uh, the bank uh, board of directors or the governors would speak to the governmental committees, Maxime Bernier would question him on this. However, the problem is is that he is no longer talking about this situation, and it's my understanding that it's not a significant problem for him anymore. This is not something that he's going to talk about during campaign season. And who knows if he even managed to get into uh, office in the slim chance that he wins in the 2019 federal election. I don't know that this is something that he would bring up once again, that he would start trying to make changes to bring the Bank of Canada back to its pre-1974 mandate. But I have never seen another politician speak about this situation. None of the leaders of the current federal uh, federal parties are talking about it, and I have not seen anyone, not even someone like Pierre Polyev, who I actually like a lot. I have never heard him say anything about the current banking system, about how the Bank of Canada is giving out loans to us at interest, and that we're borrowing money from private and international banks, which is just leading us down a bad path that we'll never be able to recover from unless we change course soon. This is a necessity. We need to change the way that we're doing our banking system because America is $33 trillion in debt. They'll never get out of that. Canada is sitting at about a trillion dollars in debt. Now that is going to be difficult as hell. But if we have somebody who comes in who's fiscally responsible, is willing to make the necessary changes and pay off and make the cuts that are necessary because we're going to need a lot of cuts to social programs in order to pay off our debt, then we're going to see that uh, then we sorry, we still have a possibility of getting out of this hole that we've dug for ourselves. But if nothing changes, Sooner or later, the whole system is going to come crashing down, and it's us who is going to get buried under the rubble. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it for today. I think I've given you 
all the information that you need to know whether it has the way that the banking system has been set up, whether that is the fractional reserve banking, or talking about the international banks and the International Monetary Fund and all these people who have manipulated us right from the get-go, who have manipulated us into guaranteeing that we stay in, a perpetual, in perpetual debt slavery. So the next time that someone's talking to you about the current debt or something like that, be sure to bring some of this up to them. I'm not expecting you to sit there and talk their head off for an hour or so, but you can tell them certain things. And one of the big things that I encourage people to talk about to show how much of a fraud our banking system is, is a fractional reserve banking, the fractional reserve lending. Because when people start hearing about that, they really see the problem that we have when they start seeing that money is created out of thin air then you see the problem that we're having so thank you all for joining me today i'm adrian lloyd this is just my stupid opinion